Welcome to this evening's question, Does God Exist? Imagine a family of mice who lived all their lives in a large piano. To them, in their piano world, came the music of the instrument, filling all the dark spaces with sound and harmony. At first, the mice were impressed by it. They drew comfort and wonder from the thought that there was someone who made the music, though invisible to them, yet close to them. They loved to think of the great player whom they could not see. Then one day, a daring mice climbed up part of the piano and returned very thoughtful. He'd found out how the music was made. Wires were the secret. Tightly stretched wires of graduated lengths which trembled and vibrated. They must revise all their old beliefs. None but the most conservative could any longer believe in the unseen player. Later, another explorer carried the explanation further. Hammers were now the secret. Numbers of hammers dancing and leaping on the wires. This was a more complicated theory. But it all went to show that they lived in a purely mechanical and mathematical world. The unseen player came to be thought of as a myth, but the pianist continued to play. Paul was on Mars Hill in Athens and saw an inscription to the unknown God. And the altar represents humanity's quest to answer the question, does God exist? What we want to do over the coming weeks is think about some of the big questions of life. And I want to start with the biggest and most fundamental of all, because from it flows our response to all the other questions we're going to look at over the coming weeks. And four things I want us to think about this evening. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that we are all believers. The question is simply, what do we believe in? The atheist considers all gods to be a human invention, idols made by the hands of man. On April the 8th, 1966, Time magazine produced a provocative black pictureless cover bearing the words, Is God Dead? The question was a reference to Nietzsche's much quoted postulate, God is dead. The agnostic, on the other hand, says maybe not sure, haven't given it any really serious thought. A theist believes there is a God, and for the Christian, God is real, and he's invaded human existence through his son Jesus to bring eternal hope to the world. People are perplexed why some people believe in God and others do not. Are some people more genetically predisposed towards religion? It's a fascinating question, because if it's true, then our response, does God exist, depends on our genetic makeup. Scientists can't agree. Philosophers think differently. They think we're all very religious people. A religion is simply defined as a meta-narrative, a large story through which we interpret the world. Science can be a story through which we interpret the world. Brian Cox described a research facility as a cathedral of science, which is an interesting choice of language for an atheist. Atheism is a religion, a belief system through which atheists interpret the world. The traditional religions are stories through which we interpret the world. The question is not, does God exist, but more, what God do you believe exists? The most popular religion here in the West today is what theologians call syncretism. Syncretism is where we pick and mix our religion, creating our own meta-narrative to suit our interpretation of the world. A little science here, a bit of atheism there, a bit of religious morality here, and what suits me making up the rest. It's not systematic, more we stumble onto it without really thinking about it. Syncretism puts ourselves at the centre of our own world as we decide what's right and wrong based on what suits us. We are all little gods. We reject notions of absolute truth and a meta-narrative over our life. We are the meta-narrative. 
as a result we reject consciously or unconsciously any notion of absolute truth and we call it relativism. Truth is what we make it to be and what suits us. It can so easily fluctuate. Someone overtakes us doing 40 miles an hour along Hampton Road and they're reckless. But if we did the same thing to someone else, it's because they're dawdling and we're justified. We are such fickle creatures. But stop and think for a moment. Can relativism be true and work? When we get on a plane to go on a summer holiday, now that's a nice thought, we want it serviced by someone who believes in absolute truth. Otherwise we might not make it to the destination. We're all believers. We all believe in a God of some sort, even if it's ourselves. So the real question is not, does God exist? But what God do we believe in? The second thing to consider is the importance of belief. If science is the crutch you lean on to get through life, if atheism is the dogma that brings comfort and consolation in all life's troubles, what does it matter so long as we get through? Countless illustrations could be used, but I read the story of five boys aged 13 to 15 who set a boy on fire because he reported them for stealing a bicycle. They found the young man near a swimming pool, held him down as they poured alcohol over his body, then set him on fire. Although he jumped into the pool to put out the fire, the boy suffered 60% burns to his body. While in jail, only one of the five expressed any remorse for his actions or compassion for the burned boy. It was reported that the other four boys were laughing about what they'd done. What we believe impacts the way that we behave. You will find some who claim to be Christians who are loudmouth, opinionated, argumentative, and obstinate and obnoxious so-and-sos. You'll find some atheists to be reasonable, compassionate, and kind human beings. We have to talk in generalities, but I hope we can see that belief affects behaviour. What you believe about eternity should affect our behaviour. If there is life after death, if there is a heaven and a hell, if there's a coming judgment where all men and women must give an account for their actions, it will affect the way that we behave, or it should affect the way we behave. If there are no eternal consequences to our behaviour, why bother? Even though mathematical modelling has shown altruism, that's concern for the other, as a desired behaviour in promoting social cohesion, there's no reason why I should be altruistic. We acknowledge belief can and does affect behaviour. What you believe about truth should affect the way that you behave. If there's an absolute truth determined by an all-powerful God, you will behave in a way that honours what God has revealed to be true. If there's no absolute truth, everything becomes relative. I can pick and choose what's true to suit my own preferences. We set fire to boys that grass us up because there is no one and nothing that can tell us it's wrong. And even though society may frown upon such behaviour, we can still laugh because who are they to tell me? What you believe about relationships should affect your behaviour. If we are to love God and love our neighbour, and our neighbour is simply anyone who needs loving, then we'll not set fire to them. If God doesn't exist, then commitment to my neighbour is determined by what I feel about my neighbour. They grasp me up, they deserve to be burned. It would be easy to go on. What we believe determines how we be behave. And, and though I've used what is quite an extreme example, it helps us see how important belief is. The question about the existence of God is so important because who or what we believe in will affect every area of our life. 
recognizing the importance of who or what we believe in, the third thing I want to look at is believing in God or believing in the Christian God. C.S. Lewis was an atheist. He rejected the idea of a divine being because of all the injustice in the world. But when he asked himself where he got the idea of justice in the first place, he had a problem. He wrote, man doesn't call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? The last few weeks has not been pleasant for many of us because of the coronavirus pandemic. And some people's response is that there couldn't be a God of love, otherwise we wouldn't have had to go through all that we have had to. Others have argued that until we face the reality of the way we've exploited this planet, then there's simply another pandemic waiting around the corner. When will we heed the warning? Our response depends on where we begin. The question we all have to face is where do we start from? Do we start with God and allow his perspective to enable us to interpret the world we live in? Or will we allow our experience to shape and interpret what we believe about God? Where we start will determine what conclusions we draw. Theologians start with the belief that there is a God. The Bible is a book of theology and starts with the premise that there is a God. It never seeks to prove God's existence. It puts forward different arguments that will be more or less convincing to different people. We could answer in a number of ways, and for C.S. Lewis it was one argument that helped more than others. Each argument is not philosophically perfect, and that shouldn't trouble us. Sometimes philosophy is too argumentative for its own good. So, in these arguments, what helps you? The mental argument says that pure materialism is not able to explain the capacity of the mind to move from premise to conclusion. The existence of logic or human intelligence, where we possess self-awareness and knowledge of God, points to a transcendence to the mind. If dolphins have the most developed brains of all animals and our brains are more developed than theirs, why don't we have echolocation? Why don't they have a knowledge of the transcendent? The cosmological argument says that everything in the universe has a cause. Even the Big Bang had a cause. And whatever caused that had a cause. And the ultimate cause is God. The teleological argument develops from this in what was caused has harmony, order and design that goes beyond mere blind chance. A watch points to an intelligent designer as a world points to an intelligent creator. Even if you work with the 13 billion years cosmologists believe the earth has existed, we can't have evolved to where we are today by mere blind chance. The numbers just don't work. The ontological argument says that something that exists is in reality greater than something that exists in the mind. A chocolate biscuit is better in reality than in the imagination. If God only exists in the mind, it's possible to conceive of something greater, a God that exists in reality. This is an impossible contradiction if God is the greatest thing to be imagined. The moral argument begins with man's sense of right and wrong. All of us have a moral code. In David Attenborough's latest offering, only the dominant male chimpanzee is allowed to reproduce. Why do we allow worthless men and women to reproduce as it compromises the human gene pool? To this and a host of other issues, we have a moral reaction and points to us being moral beings. The Christological argument says that the life and testimony of Jesus Christ can only be satisfactorily accounted for if God was present and working through him. 
Many have written books attesting to the validity of the resurrection when they have started out to prove the negative. There's something compelling about the Jesus story. The experiential argument says that many have an inner sense that there is a God and modern research indicates it has a profoundly positive impact on their health and well-being. In other words, faith works. It's transformed our society for good. Building uh, schools, hospitals, helping the poor, marginalised, all because faith has impacted behaviour. These arguments all have their strengths and weaknesses. Some will find one more persuasive than the other. But for the person who does believe in the existence of God, the clinching deal is always their personal experience. They've met with the living God and no one can tell them otherwise. So of those arguments we've uh, been through, which is the most convincing and compelling for you? This leads us to the last thing that's worth considering. If confronted by the existence of God, should we believe? It's sometimes said that you can't argue people into believing about God. Or as Dale Carnegie puts it, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. We are stubborn creatures, slow to embrace truth even when fairly confronted by it. Our brains have a built-in confirmation bias, which means we always think we're right and we're very good at assimilating information to support our bias. Our brains have a built-in sunk cost fallacy that means we use past decisions to justify current irrational decisions. We justify investing more time, money, effort, belief into something because we decided to do so in the past even though current indications suggest any more resources are wasted. Our brains have a fundamental attribution error. So a small observation leads to a large generalisation. The driver in front of me is slow. They must be old. That Christian is a hypocrite, therefore all Christians are hypocrites. Our brains have a built-in availability heuristic, which means our focus is on the here and now. We don't always make good decisions based on what we learnt in the past, what we've been told about the future. It's simply about here and now. And that's why syncretism is so appealing. What suits me now is the only thing that matters. Our brains are risk-averse. And we have to see something is significantly bit better before we will give up the idea that we previously held. Research says two and a half times better. And that makes us very change resistant. Whatever our bias, we resist proofs to maintain the status quo in our lives. We are less open than we think and rethinking than we dare to admit. It's hard to be a believing believer and allow what God says, if we believe God exists, to change the way we think. So all of us are deeply religious beings. We simply need to be honest and admit which God we believe in. The choice is crucial because it impacts every area of our life. We need to make a good choice, a deliberate choice, as to who we put our faith in. The Bible doesn't set out to prove the existence of God. It assumes we already know by whatever means makes most sense to us. But it gives us glimpses of arguments for the existence of God. Even when we might acknowledge that there is a God, we're still very resistant to that knowledge changing us and transforming us. Does God exist? That's for you to make the decision. Because the Christian God never compels or coerces anyone to believe 
in him. He simply invites us to put our trust. The choice is ours.